We're in Genesis chapter 39. We only got to verse 6 last week. My intention was to get all the way through last week, but that did not happen. In 38, we saw and, and kind of took a little diversion from Joseph's life to Judah's. We saw Judah act without character, uh, without any integrity, and uh, he, he paid a price for that. And now we see Joseph, who is not free. He's been abandoned. He's been betrayed. He is uh, a, now a slave in Egypt, sold there by his brothers. Um, so in a strange place, maybe a language that he doesn't know. And yet we're going to see what it means to live with character, to live with integrity, to live godly, even when our circumstances could dictate that we could go, or we might even be able to justify not living up to what God is expecting of us. <clears throat> Joseph, again, is, is a slave. Sorry about my voice here already. He's a slave. He's there. It, um, <clears throat> nothing's fair about his circumstance. Right? It, it's all from a human point of view. There's nothing fair about this. Right? He didn't do anything to deserve this. Uh, he may have been somewhat naive he may have been unwittingly set up by his father and his favoritism toward him which put a division between himself and his brothers but it's still not joseph's fault that he's here and we're going to find ourselves in a lot of different situations in our life where we can say this is not my fault sometimes we end up in situations like this <clears throat> and in temptations like we're going to look at for joseph now because of our fault it, right? it is our our actions our our reaction to things, our wanting to justify how we feel, uh, acting on our feelings rather than what we know. Joseph is a great example, though, of not trusting in our feelings, but trusting in what we know to be true. I, anybody, if he would, were to react negatively in this situation, none of us would blame him, right? We could all certainly look at this situation and say, oh yeah, he's justified in having a bad attitude and not wanting to serve right, um, not, not living well because he's a slave and, and not of his own doing. You know, it's not like he was fighting a war and his, his army lost and was a slave, but instead he was doing what his father had asked him to do. He was betrayed by those who were his family who were close to him and and then abandoned into slavery it's another way that story is is another way that joseph is a type or a foreshadowing of jesus and that he was doing his father's will if you go through the gospels he says that over and over and over again i'm going i'm only doing what my father wants me to do I, this is not about my will it's about father's will it, and i'm here to fulfill his will and yet his brethren, his people, hated him. His people rejected him. His people sold him out to the Gentiles and had them crucify him. <clears throat> and in none of that, not one time did Jesus enter into a feeling sorry for himself. He showed us how to live in the face of persecution how to live and be a servant, even if the circumstances around it doesn't seem fair or don't seem fair. Now, Joseph had come into Potiphar's house. Potiphar had bought him, brought him in, and he's there for at least 10 years. I think it's more like 13 years that he's working for this man. 
And in verse 2, just as a recap, it says the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. And he was in the house of, of his master, the Egyptian. Now, times when we look at a slave servant, not the master of the house. Even this thing is really messing up today. Let me switch sides with this. Maybe that's it. Huh? Yeah, it says it's fine. Anyways, <clears throat> but how, how many times would we look at that? Look at somebody who is a servant, or even in our culture where maybe it's a, a paid servant. Maybe, maybe it's somebody who's just a blue-collar worker and say that's a successful person. We don't, we don't do that. The successful person is the one that's running the shop or running the business, owning the company. The successful person is the one making a name for himself in politics or in some other way in our culture. Maybe they're a small business owner, but we would say they're successful, right? They're making money, their business is going well. But how many people, how many times have you looked at somebody who's waiting on you and said, that's a successful person? Right? Right? You go into a restaurant, it's a good restaurant, the food's good. How many times do you say that's a successful cook, that's a successful waitress, that's a successful maitre d'. You don't. You don't think that. You think the person who owns this restaurant is the one who's the success. And, and we'll attribute everybody else's service to them being a good leader. Right? The, the person who owns this, the person who runs this, they're the success because they've got everybody else working the way they should and the way they know how to. But we're never going to look at the workers and say, you're a success. We're not trained to do that. We're, we're, we're not trained in our culture to be satisfied with where we're at. If somebody is doing that, any of those jobs, any, anything that we would seem to think is just menial, we, we would say they, they've settled. Rather than they're content. Right? There's a difference in that, isn't there? To be settled, just settling for less just because you're lazy or just because you don't want to put the extra effort in to be anything more. But you're always going to complain about where you're at. But a person who's content with where they're at, we don't look at them with any better eyes do we we still look down on them even if they're hard working they do the best job they can they don't they're, they're not self seeking they're not looking to get in or get up or move up they're just where they're at right and they like it there and we don't look at them as being successful and that's that's unfortunate there are probably a lot more successful people around us than we know right they're content with where they're at they they are raising a family maybe maybe they're making just enough to pay the house payment put some gas in the car and they don't really need any more than that We want people, and, and Joseph here is, is a, the Bible says he's a su successful man. Now he moved up among the ranks of the servants, obviously. He's in the master's house, he's not out in the field. But it's because he's worked hard, he's been promoted. We're going to see his integrity is intact. He's not obviously stepping on anybody else to get above, to get uh, ahead. It says the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord is blessing Joseph. From this horrible hurt, this horrible abandonment, this tragedy of a family, taking him out the way he did. And it says the Lord was with Joseph. There's another thing to try to, that's kind of hard to, to grab a hold of, isn't it? That when we go through a, a trying time, 
that the Lord is with us. We're always looking and re-examining. Did I do something wrong? Did I displease God somehow for him to let me be here? Or to put me here? I don't know. I just saw this morning a story of... Uh, You've heard me talk about the festival, the Burning Man Festival out west. It's one of the biggest pagan festivals there is. They are very much anti-God there. And you go out there to this festival, and for however long it goes on, you live in your own little communities out there where, you know, whatever your, your uh, desire is, that's where you live. And so there's all kinds of weirdness. There's all kinds of uh, debauchery that goes on out there. Sometimes people die. Um, in the end, the whole thing, the, during this whole festival, they're building this giant man, and at the end of it, they burn it. And it's basically a huge pagan, heathen festival. And it goes on every year. In fact, in some places, it's been banned. Some communities have banned it. Because it's so just over the top. And so they're in Nevada, and the rains came, and the rains and whatever caused the flooding around this city that they're outside of has flooded them in. They're covered in mud. They're not allowed to leave. They've been told, shelter in place. Stay there. Don't come out. If you try to come to the city because access to the city is shut down because the flooding there is so bad, if you come here, we'll turn you back. So they don't, they're not allowed to drive out. They're not allowed to hike out to get to the city and try to shelter there. They've been told, stay in your mud-covered tents. And I can't help but think, and nobody is going to say this because I'm looking at national you know, things, and, and no, but I can't help but think, you know, you can only shake your fist at God so long. And, and you might think, well, it's just a coincidence that God would. Yeah, you know what? This is one of those instances when I think you kind of, you know, you, you, you can't, like I said, you can only shake your fist at God for, for so long. That's, that's something where, I mean, if they would say, oh, you know, God. And, and, and that's, the, that's the bad part about this, right? Nobody there is going to see that God's given them a warning. Right? He's, maybe they saw a rainbow, right? What was the promise that the last big flood God caused? A rainbow saying, I'll never destroy the entire earth this way again. You think any of them looked up at a rainbow in the sky after the storm and in all the mud and said, huh. Maybe I ought to pay more attention to judgment in God in the Bible. It, it's, it really is just, I mean, part of me, there's, there's the, the flesh side of me that's saying, you know, <laughs> yay, you got what you deserve. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with you suffering for a while. But there's another part of me that's kind of heartbroken for those people because it's not going to do anything to change their minds, probably. I'm not saying God can't use it. Maybe there are people there who were raised in church, heard the gospel, know for sure, and have turned away. And things they learned in church when they were younger uh, maybe come to their mind. Maybe they get themselves right with God out there in the mud. I hope. Oh, but something. I don't know if anybody ever goes out to these festivals and, and hands out things or tries to witness to anybody. Maybe they did before the flood came. I don't know. The articles from the world are not going to point that out. So it's possible. Maybe they're stuck there in the mud and that's all they got left to read is whatever got handed to them. I don't know. I can only hope. I can let my imagination run crazy with this whole thing, right? But it's not always, it's not always that. That's not always why we have 
the trials and tribulations. 2 Timothy 3.12 tells us this. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecutions. Now this is going to apply to Joseph a little farther into the story. Romans... <clears throat> Romans chapter 5. I'm going to start with verse 1. It's really verse 3 that I'm kind of focused on. But verse 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into, <clears throat> into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So we have all of these things, right? He's talking to believers. He's talking to people who have given their heart to Jesus. And, and Paul is writing to this church in Rome that would be severely persecuted. But he's reminding them, we have all of this. We've been justified by faith. We have a right standing before God. We have peace with God. And through whom we have access by faith into the grace which we, in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope and the glory of God. It should fill our heart with great joy, the, the understanding, the knowledge that one day we're going to see him face to face. One day we're going to stand in his presence. <clears throat> and Paul continues though with verse 3, And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produce, or tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. There, there's this challenge, right? To rejoice in the trials and tribulations of this life. To still have joy, to not let that go. Why? Because we know the end. right? We have this hope. But we can also look at this and say, God is developing me into something. Something more than what I am. When we go into a trial, you go into a dark time in your life, and, and some of them can get really dark. You go into great disappointment in your life. Things have changed, right? You have those days every once in a while. You have a day where you wake up and you go, my life has just completely changed. When that understanding hits you, things are never going to be the same again. When we get into that time, into that time of, of tribulation, we might call it, or trial. And we need to remember that going through that, and, and it's not a, an instance, it's not a day, it's a period of time. And it produces endurance, or I mean perseverance. Right? To persevere, to be determined to move forward, to be determined to press on in spite of my circumstance. And with perseverance, character. Right? So it's developing, God is developing who you are. He wants you to be Stronger in character than you were yesterday. When you come out of this trial or this tribulation time, this time when you've learned to persevere, your character will be stronger. Because right? perseverance is going to be holding on to what you know is true in spite of your situation. You're learning how to not react. You're learning to think. You're learning to endure. If we just react and are emotional about everything, you're probably going to be in that tribulation time a little bit longer uh, than maybe you have to be. Um, in James, let me see here.
James, who is the, was the half-brother of Jesus, became the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, starts off his letter with this. <laughs> My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. It's like Paul would write to the Roman church. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all liberally without reproach and it will be given to him. Let him ask in faith with no doubting for he who doubts is like the wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double minded and unstable in all of his ways. Do you see the progression there? You enter into a trial and hang on to your joy. Because joy is the decision. Joy is a way to live life. It's not being happy. Right? Happiness comes and goes. Happiness is determined by our situation, by our circumstance. Joy is a condition in life that the believer lives in. Right? We're not sadists. We're not like, woo, yay, I feel like, you know. We don't get up in the morning, I feel like crud this morning, or, or get up feeling like crud and go, you know, I'm feeling great. We don't lie to ourselves. You're not saying, Paul nor James, to ignore your situation or to act like it's something other than it is. There's a process that we go through through this trial and tribulation. We talked about Job last week. It wasn't his fault that he went through that. God offered him up. This is my servant. This is my servant. You really think you can break him? And God let Satan put him through it. And he came out on the other side. Integrity still intact. Understanding, if you read through the book, there are times dude, it looks like Job is going to break, Job's going to break, but then he, he ends up again, like we said last week, with the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, worshiping in that time. Or, I know my Redeemer lives, and I know that one day I'm going to see him face to face. In all of that hard time. Jesus himself would say in John chapter 16 when he's telling his disciples they're going to be scattered and they're going to leave him alone and in reminding him yet I am not alone because the father is with me these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace in the world you will have tribulation but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Listen, these are verses that are easy to talk about and easy to believe when you're not going through it. But there are there were verses we need to talk about, we need to remember, we need to commit to memory, because when we go through it, we need those to get us through it. The reminder. The reminder that your joy shouldn't be gone just because you're going through a hard time. Because no matter what happens in that hard time, even if it seems unfair, no matter what happens, your joy is in the Lord. It's not in man, it's not in your circumstance, it's not in your money, it's not in your home, it's not in this world or any of its systems. Our joy comes because one day this is all done and we go to see Him. It's because one day we know, because in Revelation it says He comes back and sets up a kingdom. For a thousand years. And we rule and reign in that kingdom with him. And we, we won't enter into that time going. Aha now finally I got the authority. No, we're going to be the greatest examples. Of what it means to be submitted to Christ. We'll be changed. 
will be different than everybody else who lives through the tribulation time. But we will perfectly then be walking in the, in the understanding of who Jesus is, teaching, leading, and bringing more to Christ in that time. We left off last week with Joseph in verse 6. Is, Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. He did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. So Joseph has reached such a level in Potiphar's house, Potiphar doesn't even know what he has anymore. He just knows he has more than he did when, before Joseph came. And he can see, it tells us, that he can see the Lord on Joseph. So this is more than just he's a good servant and he's a smart guy. He can see Joseph worships his God and his God alone. And his God is showing Joseph favor. And because he does that, I'm reaping the benefits from it. Again, how easy is that to go and, and go to work and work as unto the Lord like the Bible tells us to. And, and, and our job, our work, our effort for somebody else's company brings them benefit. Are you happy with that? Or are you thinking, oh man, I should be getting a cut of that? Can you just let God bless you and take what he's going to give you and not worry about whether they see you for what you really are or not? That's, that's part of being content with what God has given me, where he has me. Right? If I'm in a place where I'm making a lot of money, hey, man, God's blessing me. That's awesome. And then on your knees and say, now, what do you want me to do with this? Right? If I'm getting recognition at work, getting promotions at work because of my hard work and my dedication to my job, great. Keep at it. And keep being a witness. And when people say, why are you different than everybody else you work with? There's an open door right there. Not because I was raised with such a great work ethic. That may be part of it. Not because my grandfather taught me to work hard and to watch it. That may be part of it. But what really makes us different is we serve the living God. I'm not I'm not really doing this for everybody else. I'm doing this to be the best example of what a Christian can be to you so that you want what I have. My hope is that everybody around me has the same or has a desire to know who I know. That it creates a desire in them to want to know what is different about me enough that they'll sit and listen to it. And you're probably going to hear, if that is your, your mentality, if that is your, the effort that you're putting into your job, you're going to hear when that door opens up. I've never known a Christian to be like you. Because unfortunately, a lot of Christians think that they just deserve whatever they get. It's unfortunate. I, I, I've heard stories, I've never had anybody say this to me myself, but I've, I've heard other pastors with bigger churches and business owners and say, yeah, I won't hire anybody else from the church because they come and they think they can just sit around and do nothing because they're Christians. And I'm a Christian, so I'm supposed to just be taking care of them. The man's business is better off to hire people off the street who don't know Jesus and have him take care of them and give them a job and reward them and be the example by himself so that he begins to grow people in the Lord in his own business. And his business becomes an outreach. That's unfortunate that people would say that. The Christians, all they want to do is talk. All they want to do is sit around. And now you, some of that is going to be just, you know, they don't like Christians, so you're going to be the target. That's You're back to the trials and tribulations then. We just don't want to give them a reason to throw the mud. Right? We don't, we don't want to want to 
to have a reason to not like God. We want to represent him well. We don't, we don't want to give the, en- the enemy or, or God's enemies a reason to rejoice. That, that is told to the people of Israel over and over again. So now we're to verse 7 where we pick up. It says, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and, she, and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in, this, in the house. And he uh, has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything uh, from me but you because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Right? So, on, a, on the human level, on the worldly level, I can't do this against my master. How do, I, how, do I, how, how do I betray him after what he's done for me? After what he's, he's, he's put me in this position. But Joseph also recognizes God's favor in his life. How could I commit such a wickedness and sin against God? This is not really just about Potiphar. It is Potiphar sees God in Joseph's life. If I sin now against God, what does that do to my witness to my master? (coughs) Joseph's character stays intact. His integrity is intact. Right? He's not one thing in front of his master, in front of Potiphar, and another thing behind his back. His integrity is intact. Potiphar's wife obviously has neither character nor integrity. In verse 10 says, And so it was as she spoke to, to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her uh, or to be with her. All right? So we're not, this isn't, we can have our relationship, we're just not going to let it go too far. This is, you have a bad intent, you don't care about your husband, uh, I'm, I'm not going to be with you at all. Right? There is no relationship here. That just only goes so far. There is no relationship here. Period. He's made it obvious. He's making a hard stand. And it doesn't go away. It says she's after him day by day. Every day he's going to go to work. Every day he's got to go in the house. He's got to second guess and plan everything that he's going to do. To make sure that he avoids her at all costs. As much as he can. He's going out of his way. To avoid the temptation. This isn't just about getting her off his back. He's a man. He could probably only endure this under his own strength for so long. He has an opportunity to progress even farther. If he would enter into this with her. To have one more thing. To have everything that Potiphar has. But he doesn't want to do that. He's trying to make sure that he doesn't do that. Jesus would tell us. If your hand. Causes you to sin. Cut it off. If your eye. Causes you to sin. Pluck it out. Better to enter into heaven maimed than it is to commit these sins against God. Our sin is not just against us and it's not just the people who... Our sin affects people around us, for sure. Right? My, my mom and dad's relationship wasn't just about the two of them as much as they would like to have thought it was back then. You know, 
it still affected me, didn't it? I mean, you've heard my stories. I've talked about this over and over. It still affected me. But it's not just about that. David's sin with Bathsheba affected his family, caused him to, to try to work it all out on his own. He ends up trying to, to uh, get her husband, brings him home from the war, gives him an opportunity to sleep with his wife so they can say it's his child, and he doesn't do it because his, his men are all back in the war. They're not home with their wives. He, he won't take any comfort. He doesn't even leave the palace. He sleeps in David's doorstep. And so when David sends him back, he knows he's not going to be able to trick him. He sends him back with a, a sealed letter. With his own death in that letter. In order for him to be put on the front line. And then when the battle gets heavy for everybody to pull back and leave him alone. Now, if you read that story, and if that's all you know about the story, you might be thinking, man, what kind of integrity do all them soldiers have? Well, actually, David lost about 80 of his most elite men because they wouldn't leave Uriah alone. And then, after Uriah is dead, David marries Bathsheba, and then Nathan the prophet comes and gives him this story about a man who takes his neighbor's lamb and, and it was the only one they had and, and, and butchered that thing and ate it with his friends. And David's like, who is it? I'm going to kill him. And Nathan says, it's you. You're the one. And in Psalm 51, and David cries out to God for forgiveness. And he says to him, against you and you only have I sinned. And we look at that story and go, man, you sinned against Uriah, you sinned against... Well, he offended all of them. He hurt everybody. He murdered. He committed adultery. But his sin was against God. Everything he knew to be true, he went against. You see, it was one of the king's duties as they took the throne to write out the Torah by hand. So they had to, they had to sit down and, and, and write all of this. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So they knew the law. They knew what God expected. And both of those sins, we've talked about this before, the sin of adultery and the sin of murder had no sacrifice in the temple. There was no taking a lamb, sacrificing it before God and being forgiven. They were capital crimes. You were to be put to death for either one of those. So there was no going to the tabernacle for David with an offering. It was only going before God. David knew, like we do, because there's only one offering, and it was Jesus. David knew like we did. To have faith and have grace and experience the grace of God in spite of what he did. We experience the grace of God in spite of who we are and in spite of all the things that we've done. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've asked him to forgive you of your sins, you're forgiven. And that's hard for unforgiving people to swallow. You just do that, that's all it takes, and they won't do it because they, they think that you and I should be paying for our sin. Well, listen, we don't escape the consequence of our sins here on this planet right now. We escape the eternal consequence, and that is judgment forever. We don't cease to exist. Revelation said we enter into the lake of fire with the devil and his fallen angels. We, we go there. It was created for them, but everybody who rejects God, that's where you end up forever. And Jesus said, it'll never end. Where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, where, where the worm never dies. But 
But those of us who are forgiven, remember God works, in, and we've seen this in this family, right from Abraham down, God works in spite of us, not because of us. And he gives us forgiveness, his grace, that favor that we cannot earn. That's what, that, that is what grace is. Getting something you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. So we have the mercy of God too. We don't get what we do deserve. But the grace of God is getting what we don't deserve. And that is salvation. That is being with him for all of eternity. We don't deserve that. And we can't earn it. Verse 11 says, But it happened about this time when when Joseph went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was inside. You smell a setup coming? That she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. He didn't just walk away. He didn't, he didn't push her away. He didn't touch her. He just wiggles out of his out of his top coat and runs off. And so it was when she saw that he left his garment in her hand and fled outside that she called to the men of her house and spoke to them saying, See, he has brought into us a Hebrew to mock us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And it happened when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside. So, not only is she going to lie about Joseph, but her accusation isn't even at Joseph as much as it is at her husband. In verse 14, see, he has brought us, brought into us a Hebrew to mock us. She's rallied the other servants, even against her husband. And certainly easy to make it against Joseph. Because if they can get rid of him, man, there's a position waiting. Somebody's got to move into that, right? So she lies. <clears throat> She has this set up. She tries to get him to fall. He flees. Just as Paul would tell Timothy, flee youthful lust, right? Get out. Don't have anything to do with it. Don't stick around. Don't see how close you can dance without falling. Flee. Whatever it is that is your weakness, whatever it is that, whatever the temptation is. And listen, you know what your weaknesses are. You know what temptations can be and, you know, and what could come your way. Prepare, prepare for them. Right? Don't don't wait till the heat of the moment to think that you're going to be success, successful. Then, make up your mind ahead of time. If I'm offered this this thing, right, whatever it might be, if I if I have an opportunity to sin here, I'm going to say no. Get determined ahead of time. You don't wait till the heat of the moment to do it. That's when we fail. That's when we fall unprepared. And Joseph was prepared. Joseph honors God. He has integrity. He flees that whole thing. But she's going to compound her problem by lying about it. And then verse 16 says, So she kept his garment with her until his master came home. It's funny. I didn't notice this, but God keeps putting Potiphar on Joseph's side. It doesn't say that she kept the garment until her husband came home. He eases. She kept the garment until his master came home. Now it speaks to, in her heart, there's already a division between her and her husband. She's there in a position. She's not there to be an honorable wife. She's there for whatever perceived benefit it gives her. And when she doesn't get what she wants, she can make his life miserable. And she sees him as Joseph's master, not as her husband. But I think 
hey, this is inspired by God. Joseph, or um, God himself, speaks of this. Potiphar is his master. God's not recognizing this pagan, polytheistic marriage. There's nothing good about it. There's nothing good about the culture that she's embraced. And then she spoke, in verse 17, then she spoke with, uh, to him with words like these, saying, the Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came in to me to mock me. So it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out that he li- left his garment with me and fled outside. So it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, your servant did, did to me after this manner that his anger was aroused. I'm not sure that this is his anger is aroused at Joseph. I don't think for a minute he believes his wife. I think his anger is aroused at her. I've got a good thing going. We're benefiting from this man being in our service and you're destroying the whole thing because somebody told you no. And listen, that is, a, that is a thing in our culture today. Tell somebody no and see what happens. I've got two granddaughters who are two years old. I know what happens when you tell somebody no. I've raised five kids. I know what happens when you tell them no when they're little. But you know what happens if you don't teach them to receive no? They can't handle it when they're adults either. And we see... In our culture, whole communities are ready to burn their, burn their cities, burn their, their communities down because somebody told them no. Because they didn't get what they wanted. And, and that might not even be true. It might just be that somebody told them they were told no. Somebody told them they didn't get what they wanted. Oh, well, then let's burn the place down. They don't, they don't look, they don't seek themselves, they don't, they don't research anything, they, they just react. That's why I say you, you can't trust your feelings, you have to go with what you know to be true, not react and, and act on your feelings, act on what you know is true. Because when we act on our feelings, this is what we get. So it was when his master, verse 19, so it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke, saying, your servant did to me after this, that his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in the prison. Potiphar can't, even if he sees what's really going on, the charge has been made. And listen, we see this, and we're going to see it like crazy throughout the next year and a half or so. Things don't have to be true, they just have to be said. Right? It's, you know, we're entering into election time and, and primaries and all that business and all that's going to go on. Things don't have to be true, they just have to be said. And that's true of any leadership. Anybody who's in a leadership position anywhere. So try, like Joseph, to not give opportunity for any accusation to be made. No matter what you do. Whether you work for a company, whether you own a company. Whether you're in leadership in in a church or any other ministry. Whether you're a school administrator or teacher. Whatever it is, whatever you do in life, remember, the things don't have to be true. They just have to be said, and somebody will react on that. Potiphar doesn't do the right thing. He doesn't put his reputation on the line. Instead, he takes Joseph, and he puts him in prison. Now, it would seem that it's a prison that's not necessarily a... a, super dark dungeon 
locked up in chains, but who knows how he started. Maybe Potiphar went in and said, no, listen, this is a good man, but I can't, I can't take a chance. Whatever his circumstances are in, in his service, maybe he's got something going on outside of the family that we're not shown here. But for whatever reason, Potiphar doesn't maintain his integrity and locks Joseph up. And maybe he thinks he's doing him a favor, getting him out of the presence of his wife. Whatever the reason is, Joseph, who had it good and then was sold into slavery and then worked as a slave for a decade or, or more and works his way up and has it good again even though he's still a slave. doesn't have his freedom, but he's, he's still doing well, has a good reputation still. And then has this woman after him who won't leave him alone and is determined to either have him or destroy him. And either way, it destroys him. And when she can't have that, she lies about him and he ends up in prison. And we would look at this and say, Joseph didn't do anything wrong. This isn't fair. Why is God doing this to Joseph? Why is he letting this happen? Where is he when all of this is happening? Why isn't he stepping in? Why is he just going boink and knock Potiphar's wife right off the face of the planet? Why does he let Joseph go through this? Because he's shaping Joseph into the man he needs him to be. Joseph is going to come through all of this. And God's going to use him to preserve Egypt. He's going to use him to preserve his family so that this family of 12 boys is going to grow into a nation that's going to be named after their father, Israel. And from this family, the Messiah will come. The one who will take away, as John the Baptist said, take away the sins of the world. <clears throat> from this family... These scriptures that we read, that we have, that we have the honor of carrying around with us, these things are preserved and meticulously preserved. This argument that I keep hearing now, well, they've been translated through so many different languages. And listen, <clears throat> Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek were the primary languages this was written in. Transferred into, translated into, into Latin. Whatever, but from there it it goes from there to each language. It doesn't go from there to Germany to Russia to and, and, and you know English is the tenth one down, so now we can't trust it. And, and, and literally, forget about Latin. A lot of them just go from Greek to English, from Greek to Spanish, from Greek to right. It's not a huge jump through a whole bunch of different languages. And the way they kept the Old Testament, <clears throat> the Hebrew language, the Hebrew alphabet has a numeric value to each letter. When they would copy a scroll, this is pre-Jesus time, right? This is B.C. <coughs> when a scribe would copy a scroll, each line had to come out to the same numeric value as the one they were copying from. If it didn't, you didn't go back and find your mistake and line through it. You destroyed the scroll. You burned it. Isaiah is 66 chapters long. Can you imagine getting to the last line of that scroll and messing it up? And then you burn it. When they would get to the name of God, they would write one letter. Then they would burn the quill and dump the ink and start over again for the next letter. And each, it was meticulously kept so that we have scrolls that are hundreds of years apart from one another and virtually read the same. It's been meticulously kept. The New Testament, we can get closer in to, to original copies. We don't have any original copies, but we can get closer to original copies than any other writing, any other ancient writing on the face of the planet. We don't even get close to Plato's writings or, or Confucius or any of them, but you know they were great guys and we should follow what they said. But you can say you can get to, I think it's Matthew, you can get to 
a portion of Matthew within, it might be closer than this now, but 60 years of the original. But we're going to disregard that, even though we're hundreds or thousands of years away from some of the others. And not only that, we don't have even close to the number of copies that we have of the New Testament. Anything else, far, like super out, out exceeds what we have of any other ancient writing at all. Obnoxiously more. Either full copies or portions, you add it all up. And so we can take those and we can lay them on top of each other. And we can get a good, solid, right version of, the, of what happened. A good copy. And not only that, if we lost all of those copies, we could take the, the writings of the early church fathers and we can recreate every verse of the New Testament from their writings except for 11 verses and they don't change any doctrine in the Bible. Those 11 that are missing. That's how much God has used and, and preserved his word. It's how important it was for you and I to be able to hold something in our hands and say, I can trust this. He went to that great length. It's why when we take one of these two believers in China, they weep and they cry because they don't have what we have and they hold them to their face. You can go on YouTube and see Christians in China getting their very first Bibles where people take them in in suitcases and they, and they, and they, they smuggle them in still. And when they open up these suitcases in secret and these believers just kind of dive on these Bibles and they're holding their first entire Bible up to their face. They're kissing it. They're crying. They're weeping because they don't have what we have. They've only been able to share a book with another village and pass them around village to village and that's what they have. We look at this and we say this isn't fair, but God is shaping Joseph into what he needs to be able to have this, right? All of this that Joseph goes through comes to part of it is writing down the word of God and preserving it for us. That all comes through Joseph and, and his family. And so for Joseph to be there to preserve his family in a time of, of famine, for them to have a place in Egypt, in Goshen, where they can become shepherds, where they can grow into a nation that God will take out and give the land. That's why Joseph, but Joseph doesn't know this. He should have an idea. And he had some dreams about some being, he and his brothers being represented by sheaves of, of, of grain in the field. And they all stand up, and then his stands up above everybody else, and they all bow down to him. Right? Remember those dreams? His brothers hated him all the more for it. You think we're going to worship you someday? <laughs> we're in the story right now. God's taking him there. <clears throat> but look, even in prison, verse 21 says, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. He gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Remember, these are prisoners that are locked up in the, in the king's palace. These are people who, for whatever reason, the king, Potiphar, or I'm not Potiphar, Pharaoh has put them <coughs> in here. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison, whatever they did, Whatever they, whatever they did there, it was his doing. And the keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. <clears throat> In prison. He's less free than he was before. And yet, it still says God's with him. 
and, and that God made him prosper even there. How much money do you think Joseph's accumulating in prison? How much public, public reputation does he have? There's nobody like Potiphar saying, yeah, we, I bet you guys wish you had a servant like mine. Look at it, how much I've increased since I've had this guy in my... He doesn't have any of that now. He's got a jail keeper, a, a prisoner, a, a warden, who says, <laughs> you're in charge of this bunch over here. And has so much of a good reputation in there that he doesn't, he doesn't worry about anybody that Joseph is in charge of. Because whatever needs to be done, they're going to get it done. We're told by Jesus the greatest form of leadership is to be a servant. That he didn't come to lord over people in his first coming. He came to serve. And he set the example to his disciples. And he told them. Whoever seeks to be the greatest among you is going to end up being the slave of all. But the greatest among you is going to be the greatest servant of all. You really want to be a leader? You need to be a servant leader. You need to be willing to get your hands dirty with, with whoever you're in charge of, whoever you're overseeing. We need to be willing to be in our kids' lives. We need, we need to be willing to get down on their level, even when it hurts, to get down and play. And you know, to be a grandpa, you, you, you got to be willing to get down there with them babies. <clears throat> Took the youngest of them yesterday, who was crying and giving her dad fits. And we went and sat. And I told her she was okay. And she put her head on my chest and went to sleep. That doesn't mean I'm better than her dad. It just means she doesn't mind grandpa. And I see in her little almost three-month-old eyes, she's recognizing me. She hears my voice. She turns to me when she hears me talk. It's not because I'm above her parents or that she likes me better. But I've been willing to take a hold of her and prove to her she's safe with me. You, know, you, you boys never going to learn how to throw a ball if you don't take the time out and go out and, and throw a ball with them. They're not going to learn how to plant a garden if you don't take out, go out and, and you know, instead of having them play in the mud and get their hands dirty that way and make their mouths mad, take them out and turn some ground over and throw some seeds in there and teach them how to pull weeds and let them see things grow. Let them see mom and dad trying to outserve each other. You know, get plates for each other. And, you know, it just, in the church, man, serve. I don't, if you see something needs to be done, just do it. In your business, serve the people who are with you. If you're the boss, don't walk out when you're having a company cookout and, and grab the first hot dogs or whatever and then go back in your office. Be the one sweating at the grill. Be the one making his stuff, bringing it out to him, serving it to him. Be the last one to eat. Set the example. There's a popular saying, more is caught than taught. You overcome a lot of bad things and a lot of bad ideas and a lot of uh, a lot of bad feelings by serving people, and it makes accusations much harder to stick, especially the hopefully 
they're all untrue, right? But if it's if it's not true, it doesn't stick very well if you're exemplifying God. Sum it up with a quote from A.W. Tozer. He said this, It's doubtful that God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. You won't hear that in very many churches anymore. It's all about bless me. It's all about give me. For a long time, they've looked like a bunch of kids in a candy store throwing fits because they don't get what they want. And a symbol or a sign that God is active in your life is, is how well and how wealthy you're doing or how not sick you are. And that's not true. It's how you handle those situations, how you react in those situations. That's the evidence of God in your life. We've already read the verses in the New Testament and some in the Old that, that tell us that trials and tribulations are going to come. And they're going to produce perseverance or they're going to produce patience. They're going to produce things in us that are godly. And they're going to take what's already there and they're going to make it grow and they're going to make your faith grow. And when things really get bad for everybody around you all at once, you're the rock, right? You're, you're the one who doesn't waver. You're the one that everybody can trust. You're the one that everybody goes to to look for answers. You're the one that all your non-believing friends will come to and say, pray for me. They don't even believe in God. Pray for me. This one is sick or this one is hurt or I'm not feeling good or I need money or whatever. Pray, pray for me. You know God. I don't. You pray for him. Well, if you don't believe, what makes you think? I mean, I pray. And you may, you may receive because I pray. Because God will listen to me. But I'm not making any promises if you're always going to throw it back in his face. And what are you going to do if I pray for you and you get the answer you're looking for? What do you do with that? Is it now a coincidence, a coincidence after you told me to pray for you? But pray for him anyway. But that's the conversation. That's the door it opens up. Why do you want me to pray for you? You don't believe in my God. <clears throat> There's another old saying. There are no atheists in foxholes. When the bombs are going off and everything's blowing up. Although I don't know, they're pretty militant these days. That's a whole other religion now. They'll say they don't believe in religion, but that's what they are. Anyways, now I'm rambling. Now I'm going to start getting on soapboxes. Let's stay off of that. Listen, trust God no matter where you're at. That's the bottom line, right? You walk with the Lord, walk with the Lord no matter what. Your integrity, your character is what he is building and molding in you. And you don't compromise that. And if you find yourself in a predicament that you shouldn't be in, flee. Right? Run. Cut it off. You have a problem with going places on the internet? Take that thing out in the backyard and blow it up. Right? If you're going where you shouldn't be going, get rid of it. We survived a long time with a telephone hanging on the wall. Okay? This little three by five thing you got that you pull out and can't get away from. It ain't, it, you're not going to die if you lose it. It's got all my stuff, it's got all my contacts. And listen, I'm as guilty as anybody else. When I have to call my wife, I push the little thing that has her face on it. I don't know her number. You used to have to learn everybody's numbers, phone numbers, and write them down and all that. So I, I can be just as guilty as anybody else. But man, if you've got to recharge your phone three or four times a day, you're on it too much. Anyways, see, back up on the soapbox. 
Just let God build your character. All right? Take the, take, the, take the trials, the tribulations. It's all part of life. It's all part of your relationship with God. And, and it's letting him do a work in you and in me. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you again for your word, for preserving this for us. Lord, for this, uh, this story of this man that you took through some very bad things. But all the way through it, Lord, it says you were with him. Even though you didn't immediately change the circumstance, you were with him. You were building him into the man you needed him and wanted him to be. And so, Lord, help us to remember that when we go through these things, when they don't stop or cease as quickly as we would like. In our frustrations and in our impatience, Lord, Remind us of what you're doing in us, that you're building us, you're building a person who can endure, you're building a person who has patience, who loves, who acts instead of react. A person who leaves their feelings behind for the truth. And so, Lord, we do submit to you today. We ask that you would continue to work in us. You know our needs. You know our desires. And we know, Lord, that you are living and active in our life and that you hold all of this in your hand. Most of all, Lord, we look forward to the day when we will see you face to face. Until then, Lord, give us direction for what you want us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.